uh, can help us counteract some of the difficulties about, um, thank you, uh, about having that be accessible to students. Um, more than a legislative history, though, I really want to emphasize that uh, the, there is the importance of the direct action of disabled and non-disabled college students that they enacted in order to make disability rights an unavoidable reality for politicians. I don't want to make this sound like ADA happened because of the goodness of various politicians' hearts <laughs> deciding to finally help people, but rather through actual direct action, particularly higher education and particularly in D.C. So uh, I want to give two examples. One is Gallaudet University, part of the consortium. Uh, it is a school that is specifically for students who are deaf and hard of hearing. Um, the uh, school, however, did not have a deaf president until 1988. Um, so the, uh, particularly with the, um, during this time with, uh, with a, with a uh, president who was not hard of hearing, uh, who not, not only was not hard of hearing, but did not speak sign language uh, at all, um, there was the Deaf President Now movement, or I don't think it's like the Deaf President Now movement. Um, the um, uh, there was the uh, this move specifically to try and push for representation for a administration that actually understood what was going on with a lot of those sorts of things. Um, one of the ways that the protests would happen that I think is really interesting is students would show up whenever the president would talk and just make huge amounts of noise, would scream, would make all sorts of noise so that people would stop their feet, would clap their hands, so that the president would not be able to uh, hear and would not be able to speak. The president would say that they weren't, uh, that she wasn't able to speak unless she could hear, unless other people could hear, unless she could be understood, to which students responded that it's not loud for them at all. <laughs> Um, the other example that I wanted to talk about, again, important DC history, is the Capitol Crawl, in which a lot of people, particularly with mobility issues with uh, and mobility-related disabilities, went up to the steps of the Capitol, got rid of any sort of mobility aid that they had, and forcibly crawled up the steps of the Capitol um, as a way of, again, showcasing that disability is often something that is not thought about, that it is not something that people take seriously, and to showcase the various... Um, uh, to make this sort of, to make disability a pressing issue for people who are otherwise not thinking about it, which is exactly what we want to talk about today with ideas of universal design. Uh, much like other civil rights cases, though, I want to put this in a civil rights history, uh, discrimination did not end with the ADA, and our support for students should not stop by simply abiding by the letter of the law, but rather something more proactive. And so I'm I'm going to pass it over to Alyssa and Rebecca, what universal design looks like. Thank you. All right. So um, as the title of our presentation was Applying Universal Design to Academic Devising, we're going to talk about what is universal design. So it is a design philosophy out of the realm of architecture and built environments specifically, um, but it's broadly um, applicable to product, service, or systems. And this philosophy holds that um, things should be designed so that they can be used to the greatest extent possible by all people without the need for adaptation, modification, or specialized solutions. So the important thing is we are not talking about accommodations and um, changes to make things accessible in this presentation. That is something that's already required. There's lots of resources for that, which we'll talk about briefly. But we're talking about universal design in that we should think of our advising practices, our student support practices, as not requiring people to ask for additional support that they might need. We should be proactive in thinking about it, open to hear that it's not working, um, but really we're thinking about without needing modifications. Um, there's seven principles of universal design. Uh, first is equitable use. This one is somewhat straightforward and that's that all people should be able to use whatever it is that you've designed, um, whether or not they have different needs. Um, the next one, so a good one for that would be like an automatic door. Anyone can go through the automatic door, whether you're in a wheelchair, using a walker, walking without a mobility aid, um, you can go through the door. You don't have to do anything for it to open. It will open for everyone. Um, flexibility in use is it should be able to be used in multiple different ways. So rather than having a doorknob that's only on one side of the door that prioritizes ease of use for right-handed people, um, if you have one of the bars that you can press, or pull the whole bar, people with one hand or left-handed people, people with their hands pulled because they're holding a child, everyone can flexibly use that door and get through it. Simple and intuitive use, 
means that you shouldn't need extra direction or extra support to be able to use the thing. So uh, another built-in environment example is a ramp versus a wheelchair lift elevator to go up a couple of steps. A ramp is more intuitive. You don't have to ask necessarily. You might have to ask where it is, but you don't have to ask how to use it. Whereas a lift can vary. Different keys are needed. Different staffs and comp to press different combinations of buttons. Um, that's not as intuitive. So it's not necessarily something that's built for everyone. Um, it is more of a accessibility accommodation that was applied later. Perceptible information means it should be accessible um, through uh, people being able to get the content by different means, whether that is audio or visual or um, textural, if where uh, appropriate, you shouldn't have to ask for that information to be provided. Tolerance for error um, is about being able to adapt when something doesn't go according to plan. Um, so one example, going back to a door, all of my examples seem to go to doors, <laughs> is have you ever seen like those glass doors that you can push either direction and they will swing freely? One of those, it doesn't matter if you push when normally it'd be a pull or vice versa, it tolerates that you might have um, deviated from what was expected and opens anyway. Low physical effort means it shouldn't exhaust people to do your thing. So rather than sending people on a wild goose chase around campus to figure out all of the different offices, um, AU Central is a great way that we've kind of condensed that. So there's more um, kind of, uh, condensement in yeah. who you need to talk to. But another built environment example would be if you have multiple stories, while both a ramp or an elevator could help someone who um, uses a wheelchair to get to the next level, if you're going up a full story or multiple stories, the amount of distance a ramp would have to cover to get that increase in height is so much effort compared to being able to use an elevator. Anyone can use the elevator. That would be the option that would be more universal design. And then size and space, space for approaching use means when people come to you, they should be able to connect with you um, so that if you have chairs in your offices, they should be appropriately sized for people with fat bodies or thin bodies to be able to sit in them without armrests being an issue. If you have a desk or a standing desk situation, you have an option for someone to be able, uh, whether they have short stature or are a chair user, to be able to like have a face-to-face -face conversation with you rather than staring at the podium or desk. Um, so you should have that space be accessible. And so um, these are just some of those examples. Our, our plan is to send the slides out later. So we have some of the stuff that we've said reinforced with some examples here, but I'm gonna pass it to Rebecca. Yeah. Um, hi everyone, I'm Rebecca Little. I am a disability access advisor in the Academic Support and Access Center. Um, I'm also in my own doctoral journey and studying invisible disabilities and um, you know, universal design is a big part of that. So that's how Alyssa and I connected and, and our interest um, and how we got involved in this presentation. Um, so the universal design in the top left is kind of the original prescriptive concepts of universal design. So the seven points that Alyssa had mentioned. Other researchers and other um, educators and those looking at inclusivity in education, particularly higher education, have kind of adapted things and added to these seven essential components of universal design. Not everybody uses everything, not every way that universal design is implemented, especially in a higher education classroom with many different courses, subjects, content. Um, it's not going to look the same for everybody. Um, so what I think many of these principles of universal design, which is what's so important, it's not only the potential to address disability related needs, whether they're visible or invisible, it's also a great opportunity to address some of the other learning needs that the diverse population of AU students can bring to us. So international students, students who may not have a family that understood learning needs or disabilities or invisible disabilities, other cultural barriers that could present um, in the classroom or even in the environment of AU, matriculating in socially, academically, into clubs and things like that. 
Um, so there are a lot of different uh, methods, things that could contribute to a more inclusive higher education um, area. I think in higher ed now, one of the most common focuses is the bottom left, where there are multiple means of representation in what you do. So audio recordings of your lecture or recording yourself in class while lecturing to students, um, as well as putting it on Canvas or putting your, your professor's notes on Canvas. Um, it allows students who may need to enlarge font to enlarge some of those documents without having to ask for that from um, any of their professors or additional resources. Um, and it can also allow students to use text-to-speech softwares. For students who are English second language learners, they could use a, um, I can't even, what's, a translation device or like a, a transcription uh, software. So um, multiple means of action expression, same way, um, having audio information as well as visual information, hands-on activity and multiple means of engagement as well. Are there opportunities to engage with other classmates? Do they have projects to do independently, um, connecting with other areas on campus and other meaningful learning opportunities? Yeah. And one thing I wanted to add before I went to the next slide, is there is a huge gap in the literature on applying universal design to student support. When we look for higher ed research on universal design, a lot of it is in the classroom, which is great and important. And that's where a lot of the student um, interaction with employees of the university happens. But we all know that that's not the only place it happens. And we all know that um, our work is just as impactful in getting students to graduation as their experience in the classrooms. So that was one of the reasons we wanted to pull this together too, was to um, bring it to the student support work outside the classroom, since so much of the research is not there. Yeah, so um, I'm gonna let Ellie start with the Academic Support and Access Center, and then we'll talk more specifically about how Ellie and I play a role <laughs> at the university. Okay. Um, I got the easy part of the presentation. So the Academic Support and Access Center. Well, first off, I'm Ellie. I'm the Senior Disability Access Advisor in the ASAC. Nice to meet everyone. Um, so the ASAC offers academic support services and disability support services, as you can see. Um, the academic support services are for all AU students and um, reasonable accommodations for AU students with disabilities for the disability support services. So diving in a little bit to the academic support services, if you don't already know all the services that are offered, um, we have academic coaching, which really helps students with those executive functioning skills, planning their day, especially those first year students coming in from high school and transitioning from like an eight to four day where everything was laid out for them and then coming here where they have to manage their own schedule. We know that can be a struggle. So um, they really help support that along with so much more like helping them break down assignments, breaking down their work and task management. We have our writing center, which does everything support writing. So this is helpful for all of our students, as we know, coming in and having more writing heavy classes, um, along with our tutoring services and math and stat support. Yeah. Yeah, um, and so for the disability support services, the ASAC has a team of five disability access advisors. Students um, in higher ed are responsible for initiating the accommodation process, um, which is part of why we talk about the importance of inclusivity and universal design. Um, our three-step process here at AU is number one, the student fills out their um, application questions. We've changed the name recently, and I can't remember that one specifically, but it's a, essentially the opportunity opportunity to gather their first self-report, and then they upload documentation. Documentation um, is what shows proof and verifies that they have this disability or the disabling condition, um, talks about their, their functioning in the past and currently, and then we take that information and determine the most reasonable accommodations for them in the classroom, um, in testing, or whatever their, their personal needs are. Um, but the reasonableness of this is what is, I think, important for um, our universal design conversation. Um, we have a lot of resources available to a lot of students. Higher education classrooms are just generally more independent for learners. Um, and a lot of a, a lot of misinterpretations at times can be that accommodations are kind of a fix all where they're not. It's equitable access. That's what we are here to provide. Like we are approving what reasonable accommodations will provide you that access in the classroom. But there are some things that are still tough that accommodations 
may not necessarily address or people without disabilities may also experience. So a lot of the intersectionalities that we see in our, our student population, um, I said English language learners, um, you know, just stress in managing a new environment more independently can add some limitations that are temporary that once we kind of adjust and get through it and get used to the environment can learn to cope with. Um, but we just review the reasonable accommodations for students with disabilities, but there are a lot of strategies and, and resources from universal design that can address other things and other challenges many students may face in the classroom. Which we're gonna and get at some examples now. Yes. Um, I'm gonna start with number two because we've been talking a lot about doors, I feel like. Yeah. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and these are things like we're all actively working on. I know this one, like student broken ankle, right? Could have been me. Um, and we'll be using mobility aids for the remainder of a semester. So something that we all can do is, okay, looking at the place, is it accessible for all? If somebody were to come in with a mobility aid, would they be able to get around all the desks, make their way to the front, go to the bathroom if they need to leave, come in and just making like offices accessible, right? Looking like, just looking at the placement of everything. Um, another one, I'm gonna group the, and jump in at all, obviously. Sure. I'm gonna group the first and the fourth together. So, you know, a common request we get are classroom and testing accommodations. So really working with the students on their needs ahead of time. Oh, is writing a strength of yours, right? No, is math a strength of yours? No, okay, so maybe not having four classes the first semester that are all writing and math happy and really like working. And like, again, this is something like all students like can be asked judge, and helped and worked on. Um, and then number three, you know, a student that might be triggered by a certain topic, I think for, you know, we may not know and we probably won't know that this is happening. So I think like prepping students on what a course is, expectations of a course from all of us, um, working with students in class before certain topics are brought up, allowing students to take breaks during class and not having to explain themselves, right? Um, like there's just different reasons for all different students for things and some, are likely not comfortable disposing. I think one of the most important pieces of this is that while to some individuals, it may seem like, okay, well, yeah, testing and classroom accommodations for ADHD, that's kind of going to look the same for everyone. It doesn't. Um, every individual with, you know, I think it mostly doesn't matter the type of disabling condition or disability that they're diagnosed with or medical condition they're diagnosed with. Everybody experiences it differently. There are a lot of comorbid um, diagnoses or co-occurring symptoms they may experience, and um, it's not always so straightforward. So that's why we have the conversations with students. And I think a, a big part where our practices outside of just being an instructor or, you know, Ellie and I in the ASAC um, is encouraging conversations with students. And I know our wonderful advisors here will talk more about it later. Um, but having those conversations and making sure students are looking through the syllabi, you're including that information of, if you have difficulty or anything that you want to talk with about your learning needs, put that in your syllabus so that the student knows that you're aware that that's a possibility and may feel more welcomed to come to you and talk about the resources or things that they may need. And we're going to have a fun activity to really like put this to life to, so you can like, you know, maybe view this from the lens of someone else. All right. Thank you. Okay. So now we're going to do a little bit of um, application work. So um, how this is going to work is we're going to briefly describe a scenario and think about how that applies some of the different um, universal design principles. And um, you can let us know um, which one you think it is. And um, if you're in online in the chat, uh, feel free to put that there. We can't see them easily from the presentation screen, but someone will be looking off screen. So this first one. Um, proactively sharing disability-related information with all students in your caseload. Which um, principle do you think this exemplifies? And by this, I mean, we're first-year advisors. When we send our welcome information to students, um, putting this is how you apply for accommodations in that main body text of that email that goes to everyone. Um, so what would that be? 
which principal? We yeah. have one. We have Justina from the chat saying low effort. Yeah, that's a good example. Okay, so we've flagged number one. I do think six is a great other example where they don't have to ask for you um, to give them that information. It's already there. So that is low effort and it's equitable use in that everyone gets that information, whether or not they were aware that that was a thing that was a resource available to them. Because students, especially international students coming from different legal systems, might not know the higher ed regulations that guide accommodations. Um, the next one that we had here was guiding students through the petition process. Uh, this is something that we see a lot, particularly as advisors, but I imagine that pretty much everyone here has had some contact with just the idea of having a student understand what a petition looks like, what are what are options that uh, would, they would be able to petition, what that actually entails. So uh, which of these seven do you think that this would fit into? Any thoughts? No response. The chat, anybody? Wow. I heard you <laughs> like a teacher voice, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna go with four or seven information because they don't use the system that we do. Yeah. They need to know how. We've got a four online too. Absolutely. So um, uh, if we can go to the next, where, um, do I switch? I didn't do it before. Now I'm so good. Okay. I did. Um, <laughs> you did. Wow. Thank you. Um, uh, yeah. So four is definitely right. Perceptible information. We want to make sure that students not only know what is being available, but also like to know whether or not it applies to them. Um, right. Again, guide through students through particularly individual stuff. One of the things we have emphasized here is the individuality of various students is very important. Um, also, tolerance for error. Right. The idea that. Uh, there are going to be certain things that aren't going to fit. There are going to be scenarios that uh, even, right, universal design cannot anticipate uh, whether that is anything from, right, we talked about a student tripping and breaking their ankle or something, um, right? There are all sorts of scenarios that arise that's an individual case, uh, right, and for, uh, where an individual case would be important in providing students with the ability to uh, work through that system, even if it didn't work for them, is important. Um, thank you. All right, the next one, providing stu all students opportunities to privately disclose. And again, the opportunities is emphasized here because this is different than asking your student, do you have a disability? This is providing space where they can feel comfortable with you telling you that information if they think it will help their interaction with you. So that's what I mean by opportunity. Thoughts? Flexibility in use from... Um, we got one online and one in here, and both of you were correct. We thought this was a good example of equitable use and flexibility in that students aren't required to do this. They can when it's applicable to them, um, but also it's not something where they have to schedule a special appointment with you to talk about it. You, um, you've you made it clear that you're willing to work with your student and talk with them about uh, whatever it is that they think will help you help them. Um, our next is in short communications are presented in accessible formats. Uh, this seems intuitive in some ways, right? And certainly things like having closed captions, uh, having alt text, uh, things like that, providing email summaries of in-person meetings, um, but also things such as if you were providing like a PDF flyer for something, making sure that it's also accessible via other forms, right? Not just alt text, but maybe even providing um, some uh, uh, written material in the actual like body of the email or something like that, rather than simply attaching a PDF flyer. Um, so what do we think that this might fit into? First and second? Three, two, and three, someone said in the chat, Chris. So we got one, two, and three. Two, another two. All right. We uh, we said that this was for uh, the first four, right? So. <laughs> Very good. We got, uh, right, so equitable use, uh, right, again, providing this for students without having to ask. Flexibility in use, making sure that, right, no matter uh, what sort of scenario, uh, uh, whatever a student might need, that that is being covered uh, um, preemptively rather than, again, having to ask. Simple and intuitive that it is something where you don't necessarily need to be told how to or given instructions on how to access inf this information and making this information accessible so that students have this information and they know that it is applying to them and they can find it as easily as possible. Yeah. And part of the universal design idea is if you're ensuring all your communications are presented in this way, 
you never have to think about doing it as a special case for a special situation. It's just a part of your, um, what's it called? Is your day to day. Process, your day, yeah. to day. It's just part of getting the email ready to send. Microsoft Accessibility Checker could be an example of that. Okay. And then our last little exercise here is offer accessible meetings without students having to make a special request. So that could be um, your office physical location. Is that accessible? We know not everyone's office is based off of the building design. So what do you provide as an alternative that students don't have to ask to get in our office, that looks like we offer Zoom meetings and in-person meetings. Um, when students sign up, they can opt for whichever one they need. They don't have to ask for a special offer for a modality after the, the case, um, but that's just one example of a way to do that. So which, which number, anyone online? Anyone in the room? I guess it's so hard. Six. Six? Yeah, so again, a plus students in the room and all five, <laughs> you're getting all of them. Uh, but yeah, so we were specifically thinking about size and space for approach and use um, in that your student is able to get into your meeting, however it's being held, but that it's low effort. So that students who might technically be able to go up the stairs, but have other issues like chronic pain that could make that worse, um, they don't have to. It is lower effort for them to have the other option and equitable use and flexibility. Um, this is a situation where you know, the student might be home for the weekend for a family obligation, but the ad drop deadline is tomorrow and you want to make sure that you don't have to do a tolerance for error petition later. Mm -hmm. Having this built in that you have multiple forms of meeting options can help make that be resolved within the ad drop deadlines and save a lot of people a lot of work. All right. Um, yeah, so um, I can I can just do it from here. So this is a summary. This is, again, uh, something that um, we want to make accessible through multiple means so that you can look at this later. Um, there is one thing I did want to highlight sort of before we move on from a lot of this that is summary, something that's a little bit new, which is point number three, uh, asking students to disclose can create a false sense of inclusivity without actually accomplishing anything, leading teachers and advisors to simply continue practicing exclusive practices under the guise of accessibility. I think this is really important. Often when I talk to a lot of people about disability, um, they're, um, they will tell me a lot of various inaccessible and uh, uh, sorts of practices that they have. And then I will say, well, what about people with disabilities? To which they will say, well, of course I would give someone an accessibility exception if they reached out to me about that. Um, or that I always ask my students beforehand, would they be a, would they be uh, feel comfortable or be able to participate in this in this project, in this assignment, in this exercise, or whatever? Um, the problem with that, right, is that obviously, right, it is not equitable in use, right? That it is uh, providing exception rather than building this into the structure, and also, right, to which many people were all say. What about disability? They'll say, well, I haven't encountered a problem so far. The response to that, of course, is, well, you haven't encountered a problem as far as you know of. That there are often many instances where students do not want to share these sorts of things. They feel uncomfortable sharing. If you say, we're all going to do this exercise, is there anyone who is not capable of doing that or doesn't feel comfortable doing that? I don't know about you, but I certainly wouldn't want to say, me, I'm ruining it for everyone. Yeah. Um, and so, again, this can create a false step false conception of being accessible without actually doing anything, uh, and in, in fact, alienating a lot of your students or advisees or other students here at AU. Yeah, so um, having that space for people to disclose in a way that is private and proactive so that your plan includes it up front is the idea for universal design is you're not reactive. You're being proactive and building your plan so that it works for as many people as possible. All right, so now we're going to narrow it down to academic advising because that is um, what half of us do in our day to day. Um, and specifically in applying universal design to academic advising, I think this fits really well into the holistic advising model where we think about the whole student, not just their credits towards graduation. And so it's a natural starting point for us to think about universal design is that we are really concerned with the whole student, um, not everything about that is our job specifically, but it is our job to think about it and talk to the student to make sure that they are thinking about their whole life. We can refer out when appropriate, but we can still ask them um, questions about how are they fitting in their basic needs to their schedule. Um, so 
the locations of classrooms transitioning between classrooms is a thing that we see a lot. Um, so asking them how they're thinking about um, getting from class to class, both mentally and physically, and the timing of their selected classes. Um, another important thing is when you think about tolerance for error, at drop week is a great part of our system that is tolerance for error and academic advising. This is a time where students can practice that critical self-reflection to see if they need to make changes. It is excellent that we are able to have that grace period to figure out if something is working for them before it's set in stone. And so um, that is one, another example of tolerance for error that I wanted to point out because that was a really hard one for us to come up with examples. Uh, <laughs> all right. All right, so um, I made a, um... A schedule, and I think some of you can already figure it out. What would you talk to a student about if they brought you this schedule? This is a real schedule that you can make, by the way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When are you eating lunch on Tuesday? Yes. Yeah. So Tuesdays is rough. Uh, Tuesday is a is a rough day for this student. Yeah. There's no uh, there's no time for lunch, right? In particular, one of the things that's really important for that is something that. Uh, uh, that some people might not think about is, um, say, if you have to take medications with meals or anything like that, sitting in lunch can be really important um, uh, for accessibility sorts of issues like that. Yeah, anything else? Well, I'm looking at the Wednesday night class and then the Thursday morning early class. Yes, yes. Wednesday night to 8 p.m. and then starting an 8-10 class on Thursday morning seems not like perhaps the best uh, for, for a variety of, of 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 different sorts of accessibility means doesn't seem like maybe the smartest option. Um, yeah, and again, we can think about that with the idea of like just simply giving yourself enough time to sleep. Um, and thanks. We have a couple people from the chat. Justina shared that um, they would ask, "Can you do that day on the twenty seventh? Um, yes. But then maybe they really could, and that's okay. So to let them do so. Mm -hmm. um, and Lillian said, "Going to bed late on a Wednesday and waking up early on Thursday. No questions about that. I think uh, we understand, Lillian, for sure. Staying up late and waking up early for class. Great points, everyone. Absolutely. Um, oh, yeah." I would say, what are you going to do on Wednesday? Yeah, that gap to yep. make sure it's Monday to class. On yes, Thursday. Yes. Having no yeah. class on Monday, having this very large gap, uh, these really large gaps on Wednesday and Thursday, right? This is not going to have a very sort of like, if you are a, a someone who really relies on having sort of a rhythm to your schedule, this is maybe not the best sort of thing for you, right? This is a possibility where maybe the schedule does work for you, particularly maybe the student works on Monday, right? Maybe they have a job where they're not able to have classes on Monday, but um, right, and there's certain accommodations that they might need to make sure that their schedule works. But um, but rather thinking here, right, if you're someone who needs a rhythm, right, this might be a little bit difficult for you. Any other things? Gina in the chat said, encouraging students to think about how they're going to use their free time wisely. That's a very good point, exactly. Yeah. I want to, oh, sorry. I just want to say that as students progress and they're now in junior and senior year, Sometimes it does look like that yes, because yeah. there are no other options. Yes. And it's a different conversation about how can you get support for this? Yeah. Because yeah. we're like, the don't plan do on this. You're how, gonna not how are you going to eat lunch on Tuesday? Yeah. The answer might be, I'm going to pack lunch and yep. make sure that I'm allowed right. to eat in one of these two classes. Mm -hmm. And that could be a way to solve that problem. But the important thing is having the conversation of you're making sure your basic needs are going to be met in your schedule, correct? And then they can think about it and come up with their own plan. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Any last one? Yeah, yeah, the only thing I was thinking is that the final exam schedule might be Yeah. Yes. Final exam, exams might be hard here. Yeah. Any others before I, or yes? Yeah. Speaking of, uh, my name is Alyssa, I'm a career advisor and uh, earlier now. So it's even at Dungeon Instructor teaching career exploration development courses. I'm teaching for the first time this semester in that 1255, so <laughs> two, 10 block. So from even earlier this morning, I'm thinking, okay, so for me, I have to make sure that I, because I sometimes will eat lunch at one. I, cannot, I cannot do that when I'm teaching, right? So I'm even thinking, okay, I'm going to have to build in my schedule from 12 to 12. Yeah, I've been thinking about this. Myself. 12 to 12 45, that's my lunch. And then, well, actually, 12 to 1230, and then start to pack up and then walk across to, you know, to uh, first, which I have that done. Building may change if I have a student with accessibility, mobility, um, who may need a mobility aid because that, as we know, that building doesn't have, uh, doesn't have an elevator. 
here. So it's, um, but in any case, I was already thinking, I'm going to tell my students that they're welcome to eat during their class. So that's something that we can also model for, you know, they can eat, they can bring lunch, they can, they can, um, because I had a student last semester say, what's your food policy? Like, so I was teaching at 2.30, which is also an optimal time for a snack, right? And I said, I didn't even think about saying, I said, you're welcome to eat, you're welcome, you know, absolutely, I don't have it, you know, but I, it, it, it dawned on me, I, once again, I should, I should have made that clear um, versus having students ask, right? Because I'm sure there's, because my own philosophy too is that there's one one student who's curious about something, then you know, like most students are also yeah. having a question. Yeah. yeah. Um. We love that. Yeah, yeah. That's a, I was going to say, that's a fantastic yeah. way of, of thinking about it and exactly the kind of stuff that we're trying to talk about here, right? Uh, if one student is approaching you with a question, that probably means they're not the only one. Um, yes, and then we're probably going to move on. Okay, yeah. uh, the only other thing yeah, I'm yeah, thinking, I'm going to give the example, is if Monday is your work day, that's why you have to play. But you might also need to think about making sure your time to prepare for your class. Yes. yes. So if I work Monday and then I load up Tuesday, when am I getting that homework for yep. Tuesday? Done. You know, maybe it would make more sense to you could move that big block on Tuesday somewhere, and then at least you can get your core homework done Tuesday afternoon. Yes, and that's a fantastic point. Um, and uh, oh, Aaron, oh, sorry, one more. Um, so usually the conversation I have with students is asking them when they have their natural energy source. Mm -hmm. Um, yes. everyone's different. So even for me, like when I was in school, Tuesdays that that's fine for me. Midday, perfect. If I had a night class, that would just, I, I just lose it. So I think for me, it's a conversation of, are you a morning person? Yes. It's going to be difficult to have classes in the evening um, to find out how that could work with their schedule and their, their natural energy, energy source. And they're not taking a whole lot of night classes when they're just going to be tired. Yeah. Not, not and easy. that's a great example of a way that you can frame having them think about that without asking them, like, do you have a disability that makes it so that you have to do stuff at different times? You can talk about them other day. They can know what they're considering when they're thinking about what times work best for them. And they can talk to you about it if they want to, but you're still having that conversation and giving them the tools without needing to, because you talk to every student that you meet with about their schedule, about making sure they're thinking about how it'll work in their life. Can you summarize what she said quickly? Yes. Since um, yes, Aaron was um, talking about asking students about when they have their natural energy source and when they work best. Because um, in this example, she said that she works great during the day, does not work great in the evenings. So Tuesday would be a much better time to have more classes for her than in the evening, but other people have a different um, general rhythm. All right, and one other thing I wanted to point out before we get into the next slide is with food, food allergies are also a disability. And this is not a thing that anyone has to do, but what I do in my classroom before I bring up food policy, whatever, is I just flag um, at the beginning to if students are comfortable sharing, if they have a food allergy, let me know. Um, that way that can inform my food policies. If no one lets me know, I allow people to eat and bring their food. If someone says I have an airborne peanut allergy, People are allowed to eat in class, but absolutely no peanuts yeah. would be the policy for me that semester. Mm -hmm. um, so there's ways to build it in where your default is, yes, you can bring your lunch. But when you're talking about that, mention that allergies exist. And if anyone has one, to let you know so that you can make sure the classroom is safe for them as well. Yeah. Um, and then one other thing I'm going to point out here, particularly, in early, we had an earlier comment about the idea of for many people, the growth schedule might look like this, and then what are the accessibility issues that you are then going to try and utilize to make sure that you are able to utilize the schedule is, uh, to the best of your ability. But I also uh, want to add, in thinking with accommodations that you do already have, right, I put here SAT 202 directly uh, before writing 100, right, so a test uh, heavy course directly before a writing intensive course. Um, if you have an accommodation that is specifically about uh, getting a longer time during tests, which is one of the most common ones that, uh, that we see particularly, um, 
Uh, throughout here, if you have an accommodation for extra time during tests, that doesn't necessarily mean you have an accommodation to show up late to writing 100. So if you have extra time to take that test, you need to make sure that you are being uh, that you are working with a professor both in that class and also the class directly after that to make sure that you're able to sustain that schedule with the accommodations that you yeah. have. So just thinking proactively about that. Yeah, maybe there's a section availability where you could switch so you have writing first, a class that you're more likely to have stuff that you've turned in not as a timed in class thing. And that might be a better back to back for you to work out because you don't have to worry about potentially being late. So, so yeah, so talk through, this is kind of a summary slide again. This is a summary. Many of you brought up the exact sorts of points. Uh, I really like, uh, right, I'm gonna, so right, uh, thinking about meals, thinking about medication, thinking about sleep, thinking about transition time in between here. One of the things we didn't bring up is if they're uh, looking to make sure the class isn't over in Spring Hill, um, something that sometimes students aren't necessarily looking at, um, but also the the timing, thinking about back to back, thinking about right peak personal uh, 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 personal peak performance hours, uh, all those sorts of things. And will you be able to have a consistent daily routine? Do you know that this is something that you're just capable of working in? And again, emphasizing ad drop uh, as a as a method of being able to think through how this is working for you. Do you have uh, a question? I appreciate your uh, vocabulary using ad drop as a critical self-reflective moment. I mean, you know, I really wondered when you were just emphasizing the ad drop deadline, which is uh, September 9th, um, <laughs> yeah. um, but can you find yourself engaged in conversations regarding the last day of withdrawal? Which yes, great absolutely. And yeah. that same mode of critical self-reflection. So. Yes, yeah, so specifically in AUX1, um, I'm planning to do it more than I did last year, though we did bring it up. But um, because add drop is when you can also add something to replace it and you have the most ability to make changes, not always, not every change is a good idea, um, but you have the ability to do it if you want to. Um, that's why we're emphasizing there. But yes, the withdrawal period is a great um, example of how that tolerance for error doesn't end on that last day of add drop. There is another set of weeks for you to figure out, oh no, this class is, I thought I would bounce back and that's not happening. Um, later, you can make that decision as well. Can I, I want to add one thing. So one thing I will note that I think somebody mentioned is classrooms can change, right? Like the buildings can change at any time throughout the year. So I think a good way to bring that is, do you need breaks between classes, right? Just like make it a general, like, do you need break? Do you need time? Um, it's just one thing I wanted to bring. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Do you need to mentally transition between mm -hmm. subjects, not just physically move from oh, one classroom yeah. to another? Exactly. Mm -hmm. So, right. so we had another schedule, but we're going to move past that. Um, so we have an activity. <laughs> Yay. Okay. So I, Ellie and I were really excited, um, but because we only have a few minutes and know that you all may be heading to your lunch break or uh, to other sessions, we'll pass out a few of these and you can, um, there are instructions that Ellie didn't take with her for one set. But we're going to share, these are exaggerations. Just understand that we have not taken our own personal experience or direct experiences of others, but these are common adaptations to kind of demonstrate some challenges students with diverse needs may experience in the classroom. There is one video for those of you in um, on Zoom. We were going to put breakout rooms, but I want to kind of show this video to everybody and share the sound within Zoom. So hopes you can hear it. Audio processing disorders are an invisible disability that many, many people can experience. And then in turn, without the proper accommodations or, um, you know, resources for them, it could be really difficult in the classroom. Um, so I'm going to pause the share really quickly just to switch screens really fast. Um, it's going to be loud. It may be overwhelming or a little overstimulating for some. That's part of the process. It does say to wear headphones. We don't have to. So if you need to step out, if it's too loud or overwhelming, please feel free to do so. Can I go in your teams? Rebecca. So it's supposed to be loud what? as part of the simulation? Yes. Okay. Which one do you want to start? How many do you want to choose whoever, hand out whatever? There's one of each different, or do you want everyone doing the same? The, this one needs links. The same time. So just hand this and a handful of links to them.
So I think in terms of the tech, if it doesn't work, we're still going to eat it. Um, I think we're going to do the video first. Yeah. yeah. I'm not sure how everything works. We might not have time for the activity. Yeah. Just the video, but okay. <laughs> Was that the video? Yeah. Welcome to my video. team's chat, everyone. <laughs> um, the link didn't go. There we go. Okay. So for the first minute, <laughs> it's an ad. Um, for the first couple of minutes, it'll be silent. That is on purpose. Um, and it'll ask you to read some things on the screen. Um, so you'll hear it. It'll be obvious when it starts. Um, I'm going to share my screen after the commercial for those on Zoom, if I am able to. Okay. Yeah, I've said, I told them that it's Zoom will send it out mm -hmm. for post session. Okay. Well, how many shares do I have? Okay, you're about to hear the sound. There was a boy named Jack and a girl named Joe. They were both brother and sister. They were both instructed by their parents to get some milk at the market since they ran out this morning from eating cereal. Jill put on her blue coat as Jack got his hat. Jack was all ready to go. Eventually she decided and off they began their adventure to the market. Along the way, the dog street and the meat it. Knowing well that they needed to be home soon before it got too dark out, he left them Jack comes and says, Wow. That's a little Jill comments, Yeah, I could just grab the cloud, grab one, and eat it. They finally made it to their time for supper and at the dinner to parents about their small adventure to the market. So they then ask some questions. Do you guys know what color the person's jacket was? Blue? I don't remember. Um, do you remember the person's brother's name? Jack? For some individuals, that is what it is like to sit and listen to someone speak to them with no transcription or no um, you know, visual uh, support for what they're saying. It's um, There are a lot of videos like this, similar experiences for what it may be like to have um, sensory disorders. We also wanted to share a quick um, video of what, or a sound a colleague of ours provided for us. Um, for some students that may be um, English language um, as a second language learners. And do we want to do that in the room only? Because it's time. I can't, yeah, it's yeah. fine. Um, we can send the video to everyone for it if you want to share the yeah. conclusion. Um, just so that you can see what it may be like for someone who originally grew up speaking English to listen to a Spanish lecture or vice versa. Um, and we also have one 
in what's Rose language? Hindi. Hindi. Um, sharing the experience from maybe a, a language not as many people might have some familiarity with. Um, so again, it, it covers a lot of intersectionalities that our students may experience um, coming from all over the world here. So I hand it back to Alyssa. Um, Thanks for our audio. Uh, can, can people in the chat hear? Pat, are you able to hear? Yes. Yes. Cool. Um, uh, all right. So just to, to wrap up here, um, uh, thinking with universal design is trying to think with disability first, thinking with, uh, thinking of it as, as, uh, thinking of it first, rather than thinking, uh, right, making accessibility the rule rather than making accessibility the exception. Again, not putting students in, the slide should back up for the Zoom. Oh, um, well, that's okay. They can still, uh, yeah, we'll, they can, we'll, we'll send it out and they can hear for the moment, um, right? Thinking with the disability as the rule rather than the exception, not forcing students to be in a scenario where they feel as if they are uh, being somehow burdensome to class and not making it to where the entire impetus is on them to make sure that they are, uh, are, are ensuring that your classroom, that your office, that your uh, uh, whatever you are doing to help with student services is accessible, ra rather that you are providing that first. Um, but also further, that accessibility is at its best when it's communally driven. Implementing universal design should not replace talking to students about their individual needs, um, right? We can't anticipate everything, which is why flexibility of use and a willingness to adapt our practices are key. Um, and with that, I think we're uh, just going yes. to have for questions. Do we have time for questions? We're already over. We're already over. Thank you all so much.